Peter Michaels. Patrick Bateman. I am indeed. How are you today? You are like the rock lops. You got a little bit of sun. Uh, we had our first real bit of sunshine in Alberta yeah, this weekend, and you... It happens to me every single year. I forget that the sun is a thing. <laughs> I leave the house. My girlfriend says you should put on sunscreen. I say, eh, it's, it's only May. And then I go outside. I spend a little too, too long out there, and then, you know, that's why my long sleeves are here. It's like a rock it's lobster. Red as hell. Uh, we've got uh, a band that has like the soundtrack for summer coming up they've got a, a new six song ep that's going to be out in no a simple days. thing no, no simple thing no simple thing we are talking about the sheep dogs how, long, how many times have you seen the sheep dogs oh god i can't even at least three four three, i've never three, seen four. the sheep dogs never, it's, it's such a they're they're a jam band you would absolutely love the sheep dogs live because mm-hmm. they jam out and yeah no and i mean we'll talk about it um but the evolution of the band including a, a certain member that they picked up a few years ago is like you know, kind of takes their, I'm sure, takes their jamminess to to the next level because he's a pretty remarkable musician, as they all are, and as is this uh, No Simple Thing EP, which is actually very simple to listen to it as of Friday. Ryan and Ewan from the Sheepdogs. Well, hold, oh, well, well, you don't want to talk about the the social medias yet? Well, I thought we'd save that for the end. You got to do that off the top every time. Subscribe. Well, until it starts to happen. Yes, absolutely. Oh, you got to subscribe baby. to the YouTube page, Bose Bar and Stage. You got to follow us on social media everywhere but TikTok and wherever else. Okay, hold on. We're going to, you go do that and we'll wait to get Ryan and you and going. Let everybody give everybody a chance. It's They're got to do it now. No, no, no. You have to do it after. No, but, easy well, links. They're, they're going to forget by the time. No, no, like, no. They're going to do it again. So much redundancy. You go into you go into the interview now. This, this is how a podcast works. You say hello to each other. We talk about uh, your brisket of last night, your mac and cheese. Wow. And then we talk about this awesome new EP that's out in two days. Mm. And subscribe. And here's, here's a great chat. Seems too structured for a podcast. Is this the podcast, by the way? Because I hope it is. Yes. <laughs> Good. Sweet. Um, I, so, I mean, I'm curious. Where are you guys right now? We're both in uh, in Toronto. Okay, cool. Is that where you live? Yeah. yeah. So you don't, Ryan, you're not just, you know, carrying that beautiful portrait around wherever you go, wherever you do an interview? I was thinking, this studio is yeah. nice, but it needs a copy of that. I know. Well, it's funny because I was like, I'm actually in a temporary place. I'm in Toronto as well. I'm moving between places that had like a gap. And so I needed to like spice up my zone because we've been doing all these Zoom interviews. So I got that picture painted of my my you know, my girlfriend's dog for Christmas, a velvet painting. And so I thought that was a good one to slap in there. So it a velvet. spices up the vibe a little bit, yeah. A velvet painting, okay. That is a beautiful dog. What yeah. breed? Uh, street Mine's dog from the Dominican, yeah. He's, uh, who knows? I'd like to get one of those like tests done on him because I have no idea what he 23 and me dog yeah. edition. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> have you have you guys done those DNA kits like personally? Not on the animals, just on yourselves? No, I I I I'm curious because I love like I find all that like, you know, where you're from stuff fascinating, but I have done it. Yeah, I got I didn't do it with myself, but I got one for my grandpa for his 80th birthday many several years ago. Great idea. There's one you can do where like there's a I found this like documentary that's they they basically like National Geographic figured out the movement of people from Africa, the starting of society, to how it like mapped into Europe, and basically they traced everyone back to like essentially a, a single tribe that still exists for the most part. And so this test that I got my grandpa it was kind of I guess maybe a little bit predated uh, 23andMe, but it showed him like based on his DNA where his lineage would have come from and how he would have like basically mapped from Africa to uh, to Europe, I guess. We it's wild. Yeah. And it's very interesting. Yeah, I want to I, I want to do something like that. And it's someday. not like crazy expensive, no, right? No, I don't think so. I think it's like maybe a hundred. I, I know for the dogs, bucks. I also have a mutt and we've long thought about getting him tested as well. And I think it's like 90 bucks for a DNA test. I saw something on Shark Tank, actually, that was basically a 23 and me. It was like a whole thing. Yeah. So you could do it. Wonder, it's like a good research tool for like uh, medical advances too, right? Because they like yes. to start coming up with like comorbidity, whatever, blah blah blah. What's well, funny? My... And that's how they caught the night stalker. That's how they caught. Yeah, that is how... absolutely true. Yeah. Solved like a 30, 40 year old cold case. 
Patton Oswalt's wife. Yeah, right? yeah, that is uh, yeah. that is quite a saga. Actually, you, you know, while you guys are here, maybe this is something we should think about for a podcast. Maybe we should start every interview presenting our guests with a fully completed <laughs> here's your genealogy 20, test. Here's your 23 and me. <laughs> I you mean, are a, you are not the father. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say you could you would definitely have the take the cake for the podcast interviewing bands. You would go the deepest. Like people ask us about like sometimes someone will throw out a random question that like will throw us off about something from you know Nardwar level stuff where you're like going deep on something from Saskatoon in two thousand two or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Going you're, straight into lineage would be pretty good. You're great. You're great. part of Neanderthal, isn't that right? <laughs> yeah. uh, the uh, there was a show like that. There was like a celebrity. Yeah, there's a like, couple of them, but, I think. But then they got in trouble because Ben Affleck was related to slave owners or something, and then they had to like they edited it out, and then they reveal. I don't know. They, re- the whole thing. they realized in North America you just can't go too too far back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't yeah. Know. Um, well, speaking, I mean, maybe this is a good time to bring it up, but, um, Ryan, I've, I've been hoping to talk to you for, for years because, uh, I used to work with a guy named Chris Lynch, uh, down down in Calgary. And I, this is how I remember it happening, but I remember him stopping me one day at work and taking a picture of me. And he said he sent it to you because him and others feel that we look very similar. Now I know your hair is tied (laughs) up right now. Um, do you ever remember getting a picture texted to you, to you from Chris Lynch? I mean, I, I, I remember Chris Lynch cause he would, he would randomly text me stuff. That sounds very familiar. So I wouldn't, I was like, I should look at my email and see if I could find that photo. It would have been like seven or eight <laughs> years ago, probably. That's so, I No, I do. I do remember. I don't know if I remember that exactly, but All I right. remember he was always good for like a random email or message every once in a while with something like, you know. <laughs> Often, probably late at night. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it was pretty. We always wondered if you two had ever been in the same room together, because uh, yeah, the looks were pretty damn similar. Yeah. Well, now we hear you guys have a green screen there, so for all we know, we could be. You know, this could be some crazy trickery going. <laughs> that is true. Right. That is true. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, can, thanks for joining us, guys. And um, I know you guys have been super busy on the the press junket, but congrats on the new EP. It's very exciting. It sounds awesome too. Thank you. And it's got a real summer vibe to it. So mm. it was, was it recorded last summer? You guys did it in 2020? Yeah, recorded in summer, made for summer. Yeah. You know, once once that uh, Labor Day weekend comes around, that's it. <laughs> Take it off the <laughs> off the turntable. Was yeah, it? We, I, they always describe our music as summery, and then like, I don't know, I don't know why, but it just gets. I guess it just works out that way. But that's a part. Like everyone likes summer, so I guess it's a good thing, right? That's fair. Now, when you recorded, when you guys gathered last summer, um, I read a quote from you, you and where you said recording together during the pandemic was like finding a life raft after floating in the ocean for 90 days. I thought that was very well put. Like, were the plans pre pandemic always to, to lay down these tracks in summer of 2020? No, we were supposed to do them in the spring. Okay. <clears throat> uh, we were going to go to Portland in, uh, April and, uh, we were in Saskatoon getting ready for Junos and then, then, you know, the news of the big pandemic came down. So it was sort of like, Oh, everything's on hold for now. We just wait and see. And then like another couple of weeks ago by and we'd wait and see some more. And, you know, you you guys remember what it was like. I mean, we're still in it, like where it's like, (laughs) you don't know what the next two weeks are going to bring, but basically we were all together in Montreal doing a Canada day live stream. Oh, cool. Uh, And so we're like, well, we're all together let's sneak into a studio here and and you know try and do some of this damn thing because it was never the plan to do it that way it just kind of like everything in covid is basically like fumbling around and trying to figure out i mean just look at the government it's like trying to figure out what the hell is the right response i guess you know yeah across every single border possible in this country (laughs) and how did you guys decide on ep as opposed to doing a full length well, I mean, it was, it was a weird one, right? Because again, like trying to figure it all out. I mean, in our mind, we wanted to get out in there and, and, and record something, but we also wanted to like, you know, not tackle too much. We wanted to like focus on the things we're doing. The way we decided to do it is like all of us in the same room playing together. We did it to tape with the idea of being like, let's capture the, the performance of it. Let's not just think about like these songs, but let's also capture the essence, you know, what we do a lot is just play live. And so, 
you know, we wanted to have that. And so we didn't want to bite off too much and try to tackle too many songs. But also it's a weird one, right? Because like we are an album band. We've always been an album band. I mean, this was set to be um, you know, our seventh studio album. And, and the idea was sort of that let's change it up a bit because of the pandemic. Like I was watching different people put out different albums that they'd recorded pre-pandemic. And it was, it was like shitty because you could imagine like some people I know had waited a year to put something out they were planning to put out in, you know, April, 2020. And that really like kind of got, you know, shut down. And so in our, in our minds, we were kind of like, let's try something different. Let's like do little chunks of music and, and develop the story over, over the next year because we don't know when we're going to play live. We don't know when we're going to be able to do things kind of normally again. And so the idea was like, let's take something, let's pick like songs that we think are really good together. Some songs that could go be on radio, some songs that are just kind of you know, vibey tracks or whatever, and, and put out a collection of things with the idea that we don't wait two years or three years or whatever to put out the next thing, but we just keep the ball rolling. Um, you know, we come from uh, our, a lot of our fans are like vinyl listeners who put on a, you know, a full length album on a turntable, flip it once and have like, you know, 40 minutes of music or whatever. And we wanted to mix it up a little bit, but also kind of stay true to what we do and be conscious of what's on that, not just like a couple singles or whatever. And yeah, the idea is that we're, over the next little while, this isn't going to be the only thing we'll put out. This is just kind of the first of many things we'll put out until we can get back on the road. Right. You know that makes sense, and and I, I'm just I, it must have been great to get together and and actually commit to that. Now you and you produced this, right? This is not your first time producing for the Sheepdogs. No, no, I did our Learn and Burn, and uh, and uh, I did Future Nostalgia and Changing Colors, the last two before this one. So I've done a bunch. Were you feeling just kind of extra like uh, confident about this this one around? <laughs> uh no nah, it's about the same <laughs> i don't know <laughs> i just i like doing it it's i find it easy to produce it's sort of i mean it's like my songs and stuff so i like i feel like when i i have a real like i think people write songs in different ways and and i have like a complete idea usually when i write a song of kind of like where i'd see it ending up it's not just like a, you know some chords and a few words on a notepad type of scenario so um and i think as i gotten to know my the boys in my van and, and and sort of like you know these guys more try to like write more for like what we do well i think and then also like learning part of it is also like learning how we roll in the studio and like what we do well and what we're good at what we're not good at and, and like we we've made records in a lot of different ways in like fancy studio in a not fancy studio on our own with lots of people over a long period of time in a short amount of time so uh i find like the art the sort of that world of like music recording is so fascinating because like i'm a real nerd for this stuff like i don't know how inside baseball you want to go on this kind of stuff but like i love reading like the making of records and just like it's fascinating how different it always is because it's like for every like I don't know, like album that was made in a single day. Then you've got like Exile on Main Street where they're like laboring and they're, you know, guys are passed out on heroin and stuff. Like there's just so many ways to make records. I don't know. It's fascinating. Well, I think it's really interesting too because I think that like I always picture, we've talked about this, you and I, but you know, I think records are often like capturing a moment of time in that same way. Like, you know, Exile Main Street is capturing a moment in time where those guys went and lived in this, you know, France and and tried something different. But I think like in the same way, like we have done these records in different ways. And, and in hindsight, you're like, oh, I, you know, maybe wish I would have played this part differently, or maybe I like you, you, you know, be learn every step of the way. So every new project is sort of your next way of tackling that. And I think it's reflected in the songs and it's reflected in how they're recorded and the performance. It's also it's like in this case, it was really interesting too because you know. Ewan has be, kind of become our, you know, he is our de facto producer and mm -hmm. leads us in that way. But then also, um, you know, at the same time, it puts us in a comfortable scenario because we're not like with someone new, we have to develop a new relationship and starts from a new. It's like, let's start, start like the last record, for example, for this one, we recorded over a really long period of time and we were kind of coming and going. And and this, this time it was like, we're going to do this. We want to capture this moment in time. We literally want to all play in the room and look at each other and, and do it that way. And so, you know, it's, it's an interesting way to kind of keep, keep building off that. And I think the same thing goes for, you know, the band itself. You know, it's, it's an evolution in a sense, even if you're not doing 
something totally drastically different, you're still doing it in a different way every time you record again as a band. And we've had that experience many times now, obviously. So do you let, is there any outside influence that comes into play when you're doing, cause you, you, you know, you're writing the stuff, you're producing the stuff. Do you have any, uh, like some friends or stuff that you'll give sneak peeks to, to get some feedback on as you're going? Not, not as like, not so much as in like, I'd sit down and be like, Hey, what do you think to somebody? But just like, I mean, I can tell you that like, we had these two guys that engineered it in Montreal. Um, which really learned their last, their last names, but Adrian and Nick, a Adrian Popovich. Yeah, and Nick and P Petruski. He's he's. You gotta learn these guys' names. Yeah, they're from Nick's art in, in Montreal, and they're a couple of rad dudes. Adrian is an old school rocker who played in a band called Tricky Woo, which you know was rip rocking in the '90s. Were fucking sweet, uh, and and Nick on the studio, and the two guys know their gear and all that stuff. So, you know, they're bringing that side of things, like the sort of like we recorded a two-inch tape. We've got all kinds of crazy you know, preamps and all these, you know, sweet pieces of gear. And then we, it was mixed by Tom Darcy, who is our, you know, collaborates with us on all kinds of things. And he's, uh, so, you know, just by virtue of working with those three dudes, it's like, you know, they bring their influence into things. And that's kind of the way, I guess, that other people kind of throw a little bit of their, of their vibe into it. Hmm. But I guess I should say that the five of us too, I mean, we're all like super, you know into music of different varieties and like have a lot of experience just the i mean ryan sam and i started the band together and we kind of came from that viewpoint but people like my bro he went to music school oh, okay you know it was like all that kind of shit and then jimmy our guitar player is like you know was a blues phenom at yeah. the age of 12 child and prodigy like yeah <laughs> and can play every instrument and has incredible like sensibilities when it comes to like roots music and country music so there's a lot, there's no shortage of like uh, people around and like, you know, good, good takes and opinions and things. I'm sure. Yeah, I was going to say, it's like, not like you and just comes in with the charts and like, <laughs> okay, boys, let's do this. Well, like, I there's wish definitely, so. yeah, <laughs> there's definitely a lot of, uh, you know, th there's some healthy conversation that goes around it. And I think that, you know, a lot of it comes from, you know, when you talk about friends and shows with, I mean, we're all buds. We all hang out and yeah. drink beers and listen to music and talk about music and spend way too much time together both you know on tour and off tour and stuff like that so i think like there is a there's a camaraderie it's not about like you know tearing a song down but do what we all can to kind of build that song up as much as we can and get excited about it too i'm sure you've explained it before but i am very curious how jimmy boskill ended up joining the sheepdogs like what did had you guys known him prior to for years before not at all i mean we I don't think we were even really aware of him. I, he, I, he did backline. There's one time we played at an award show in Toronto and Paul Rogers actually played with us on stage. Okay. And, and Jim was like doing backline for that show. So he like remembers like meeting us, but we don't remember meeting him. <laughs> I, and I think, I think we, he and I talked and like, we, we think he may have played at the bar that I worked at in Saskatoon, uh, a bar called Lydia's that no longer exists, but, um, and we might've crossed paths in, but, no, basically, our guitar player at the time just couldn't do it, and he quit while we were in the middle of a tour. Oh. But it was the kind of situation where we could kind of see it was going to happen, and so we needed to line somebody up. But uh, our guitar tech is a guy named Pooch. He's like, I got your guy. I got exactly the guy you want. And it was Jim. And he had been a, you know, if you know the blues world, Jim was like a, like every town has like a 12-year-old kid who they throw a strap a Stratocaster on and he does his best, you know, Jimmy Ray Vaughan, Steve Ray Vaughan, uh, impression or whatever, but he was like the best of all of them. Mm -hmm. Like he was just like kind of the man for a while. And I guess just, he was at a point where he wasn't touring anymore and he kind of had enough of doing that thing. And he was sort of finding, you know, his himself into the country roots world. And, uh, but he was kind of looking to get back into playing, you know, his Les Paul again, but like wanted to be a side man and, we got super lucky because he's a real, he's a real humble. He's a guy with like superstar skill, but like humble uh, ego. It's, it's, it's amazing. I don't know how it works yeah. out that way. And and look, to add to the story too is that uh, Pooch was so sure that it would work out that he said that if it didn't work, 
we, he would he would bet one month's salary of, of touring <laughs> that wow. if, if it didn't work out he would we didn't have to pay him for that month uh that we were going on the road but i mean jim joined our band he came and met us in where was it charlotte richmond virginia richmond virginia yeah. and uh, we did one rehearsal he learned our entire 90 plus minute set and then we just continued on a tour in america and he never stopped playing with us it was just like okay well i guess you're in the band now there was no even real discussion where it was like you know, there's no point in which we're like, okay, now you're part of the band. You just kind of almost instantaneously became the band. And it's really crazy because at that point, you know, we had been a band for quite a while. And he really like breathed this new life into our band. Or it was this new guy who was like, yeah, again, like he could play all sorts of instruments. It really like allowed us to experiment in the studio, allowed us to like expand our live show. You know, he's a great singer. He's a great, you know, he has great ideas when it comes to like different things to add to songs and stuff like that. So yeah, it was a, it was a pretty, amazing happenstance that we were in a place it was like a, a point where we were kind of trying to figure out what our next move was and this amazing thing happened that kind of rejuvenated and, and built the band up again beautiful i love that so is there any initiation when he joins the band is there something that you guys did to just make sure that he's the <laughs> you know not like a hazing or anything but just I something that you guys needed to do to make sure that he was the right fit outside of what he could bring musically when you it, I mean, it's like if we were like a sports team or something, like to make an analogy, like he, it's like he like walked on the court and like went for 50 in his first game or something like that. <laughs> like he's just like, he's such a beast. Like he's a, he's such a ferocious player and, and so fun to play with. Like I remember the first show we played with him, like I was still kind of like, is he going to know these songs? Like, cause we played, we, played, we like barely rehearsed them. And he's just like, yeah, oh yeah. Like right at my, like, like just playing a solo right up against me. You know, just like, He's so fun to play with. I was just like, I was like, this is, uh, whoa, you can just feel the energy. And it's like, I'm not going to haze that guy. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> He's already earned it at that point. Having said that, we did uh, we did ta- duct tape him to the goalposts of the. <laughs> yeah, okay, good. I, yeah. no. I love the, uh, the, the, the video announce you guys did for the drive in shows this past fall that Jimmy did wheels up in about like an 84 Chevy pickup. Is that like. Is that still what he's driving? I mean, this is the funny thing is like, he's from that area, like Peterborough, he's from, he lives in Port Hope, he lives in Coburg now, but he's from the Peterborough area. So like me shooting that video was basically, I drove to Peterborough and he just showed up in his truck and I filmed him showing up. And then he just, like that literally took like two minutes and was there was nothing acting or anything. He pulled up, got out of his truck, did that and then left and went back home. Like that, there's no like setup involved. That is who Jimmy is. He drives that truck. He lives in the country out by Peterborough and rips in the parking lot. See, I was going to say, like, with the theme of the band being from Saskatchewan, I saw him pull up in that truck, and I thought, like, yeah, that's – that. there's probably a ton of 84 shell <laughs> pickups he's, rolling through rural I mean, he's the only. He's the only Ontario member of the band. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But he's he's way more country than any of us. Like, like he's just straight, like – he's a rural dude who grew up, you know, in a small town, and and that's where he lives still, you know. So he's uh, he's, like, you know – we're like some hoity-toity Saskatoon fellows in here. You, know? <laughs> you guys yeah. still, do you still like, do you spend much time in Saskatoon still? Yeah, for sure. I mean, the, the thing is, it doesn't matter where we are. We don't spend much time anywhere because right. we're traveling most of the time. Um, you know, I still try to get back to Saskatoon a fair amount. Uh, Sam, our drummer, still lives there. Okay. Um, but no, we, we both still have family there. I mean, <clears throat> the, the one nice thing about traveling all the time, it's been weird this year because we haven't been able to as much, is that you do get an opportunity to go home, you know, and go see people more often than you would. So, yeah, no, for sure. We still spend lots of time there. I try to, for sure. And how is the vibe in Saskatoon? It's such a vibrant, uh, the musical, entertainment, uh, cultured kind of city. And that Broadway area, you bring up Lydia's, which unfortunately is gone now, but there's so many legendary v- venues on Broadway. How How is everybody surviving in Saskatoon? I mean, it seems like... Oh, oh sorry, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I was, was going to preface it by saying it like, I, I feel a bit... I don't, I don't think I can totally speak for Saskatoon because they're not there as, as much as I used to be, but Broadway is a little different these days, right? Like, it's kind of... They've lost a little bit of the music on that stretch, I think. You know, it's a little more downtown, maybe, I guess. I don't know. Where do you reckon, Ryan? No, I feel like it kind of goes back and forth. I mean, there was, I mean, I feel like Saskatoon's a bit fortunate because, you know, people really support the businesses there. So I think that there's been a pretty big push there, which is nice. It's like good community vibes where like people were getting takeout from all their favorite restaurants. And and I don't think they've 
fully started doing live music there yet, but I, they've been able to be a little bit more open than a place like Toronto where they haven't been able to be open basically at all, all year. So, um, no, I don't know. It's like, it seems like Broadway kind of like was a little bit less and people were moving a little bit more downtown, but there's some new, last time I was there, it was like, you know, last summer, I guess. And there's, uh, seem to be a lot of newer places and stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, no, I think you, know, you guys just had Kirk Dahl on, uh, on the show. He could probably speak a little bit more to that. He's, he's Mr. Mr. Sass music down there now. So, yeah, I mean, uh, he gave us some recommendations of, uh, Sass or Saskatchewan bands and, uh, he had some great, great suggestions of music that I would never have heard of unless he, he had brought it up. So, I mean, there's lots of good stuff that's yeah. always going on seemingly in Saskatoon. Uh, you know, it's, it's a really like, it's, it's a community that really builds up the people that are within the scene. I mean, we were very fortunate for that. It's like, I would say that, you know, we were fortunate because he came from a place where we were able to play in a stage where it didn't matter a whole lot. So we were ready to play in a larger stage we did. I think if you're from a place like Toronto, like your first couple of shows you end up playing, like you're playing in Toronto. Or mm -hmm. is if you're from Saskatoon, you can go and your friends can all come out. And, you know, we got to play a lot of places before we went on tour and, and you know, before we actually got in front of people where it, you know, it maybe mattered a little bit more. Not to say it doesn't matter in Saskatoon, but you know, we were fortunate to come from a place like that. We got to like really like, you know, it's kind of like being in the minor leagues a little bit in the sense that you were able to like, you know, throw a few ba bad pitches before before you went out there and, and went to the show a little bit. Um, I was wondering, I should have checked, but on that Black Keys Canada tour, were they planning on a Saskatoon stop? Yeah, oh. there was. Oh, cool. Well, yeah, I, I mean, that's such a bummer, right? It's like, that's one of the things that happened, you know, you talk about like our whole thing with the album and stuff, like literally everything we had planned, like Black Keys tour, other tours, like, you know, abroad and stuff like that, an album recording and release, like all kind of disappeared. And and so it's a very weird thing to have. Yeah, I mean, that was going to be a big one for sure. It's been a, a few years now since we played like a show. We're supposed to do Juno's in Saskatoon, yeah. which is going to be amazing. And then come back and do Black Keys, which have been yeah. Damn. Damn. Yeah, that would have been huge for the city. And it's, have you guys played in the Juno Cup before? Because Jim has. That would have been probably the thing that would have bummed me out the most, is missing out on playing in the Juno Cup. I just learned about this. I didn't realize there's like a musician-only hockey game going on. Oh, man, I bought it. I like found a guy selling an old 80s Jofa helmet on Kijiji. <laughs> And I was going to go for old Yarmir Jagger and have my hair like float out the back of the helmet. Like, I was so excited. I'm a terrible hockey player, but I was. I would have been worth it. Jim, uh, Jim uh, has played before, but no, I haven't. And Ewan is a great skater, so it's going to be me and Jim. <laughs> yeah. There, and there used to be a basketball game that I always thought would be cool to play in, but. I guess not anymore. <clears throat> and it's probably early yet, but is there talk like would that Black Keys tour happen again, or is that something that's off the table now? It'd be great. I mean, they just had a new record that came out yeah. on Friday. Um, you know, I think it's going to be a little while before we're able to go back and do concerts in arenas. So we'll see. Yeah. I mean, it's a tough one, right? When you're like talking to people, because in order for those shows to happen, it's like there's a huge amount of money that needs to exchange hands. And you can imagine like you see a band loading in a, you know, a, a, you know, whatever big arena venue, there's transport trucks and buses and production. And, you know, I think Black Keys probably have like, a hundred plus people that probably work on those, you know, those tours. So, you know, there's a lot of money in these exchange hands. I think it's going to be a little while till we get like the, the machine back and running. So where people feel confident, they're going to be able to, you know, make these shows happen at those capacities. I mean, hopefully it will kind of turn around soon, but I mean, you're even in America, you're not seeing like those big shows happening just yet. No, I think even like, I, I think I didn't actually read it, but I'm pretty sure that what was it weezer green yeah, day Hel and hella mega tour just fallout boy yeah. they, they're like yeah we're gonna do this tour but uh those canadian no, dates no canada yeah no not so much not anymore yeah, how, how we'll do you see. like what, what what do you guys feel how do you feel it's going to be once things are opened up again do you think people are going to have the confidence right away to fill up a room do you think it's going to be smaller shows to start off i mean i I, th I, I would hope once everyone's got their vaccines, we'd just be ripping it like old times. But uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, to be honest, I'm not really sure. I mean, I guess it depends on all this variant bullshit, and and, and obviously you'll see what society is like. But I mean, I think that if the general out of, the general feeling is that it's safe, people are going to want to get back to life as it was. Like I don't think you know when I hear people say like, "Oh, this is what this is what it's going to be like," you know, we're going to all just play games on zoom with each other it's like <laughs> no that was fun for it was never fun it no was, no it's it's, it's pretty tired it was, 
we like to be together. We have been, we like to gather and uh, revel and meet strangers and all those good things. So that, we're going to get back to it. I'm just going to depend on the, the medical shit, you know, making sure we're safe. I think one of the things that's kind of encouraging is that you're, I mean, you, there was about two or three weeks ago, they did those test concerts in Liverpool. Yeah. And cause like live nation as a company, I think is, is try is they're going to be like a while before they're really back and rolling. And so I think they've invested a bunch of money in, excuse me, in rapid testing. Right. And I think that's kind of the key. And that's what they did for those UK shows. It's like the idea, it's like rapid tests are kind of like the, like, you know, pregnancy tests at the pharmacy where it's like, the idea is like maybe it's only right seven out of ten times and if you get that positive test you're going to go get the real one in the same way with COVID. is right. that you know if they give if they get 10 people out of the thousand they're going to have have COVID. it could put people at risk if they can eliminate seven of those ten that like brings the risk down and the more we kind of kind of do that i think you get a little bit more comfortable with it so i think like they did in liverpool where they did four thousand capacity rock show and a four thousand capacity uh dj show no distancing no masks and they just rapid tested and they had I, as far as i know they had zero um issues with it so i mean that to me is really encouraging so i think that if that's the way we have to go unfortunately that's probably going to mean that they'll have to part you know they'll become an extra service fee like the right like the, the cleaning fee in the airbnb it's like becomes the, the a good point fee um but at the same time if that's what we have to do like you and said to in the interim before we sort of figure out some of the uh, things I think that's that's I'm okay with that. I would rather I would rather do a full capacity show where people felt comfortable than uh, you know a hundred dollar ticket show where only a handful of people can come. There's like a you know it makes it more challenging for fans to come and see it and unless they're in a certain you know tax bracket I guess or whatever. And I think that it's like important that it's like inclusive and it's important that we could. I'd much rather do a show at full capacity than you know compromised capacity and stuff. Can I can I still wear like a flaming lips bubble to at least one show though? <laughs> Didn't they do like one? Yeah, they did actually. The yeah. Everybody, everybody yeah. was in the bubbles. <laughs> they they've been doing the bubble for what almost uh, what twenty five years, thirty years, and uh, they finally got to make real practical use of it in twenty twenty. <laughs> Those flaming lips is always ahead of the curve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. um, been doing COVID for years. Well, in the meantime, you've got this new EP out. And I will say for vinyl collectors that uh, that colored vinyl for no simple thing is sweet, real nice. Um, but you've also got rolling papers, which I didn't notice. <laughs> are those old? Those rolling papers are from the last record release. Yeah, we didn't. They, there's they, they they get manufactured in China, so they're not rolling in super quick these days. Okay, so, fair enough. We're we're gonna we're gonna save. We'll get more. I'm gonna get more made when we go back on the road. It was, but we still have lots of stocks. We have. Yeah. It's all the old ones. I, direct from Wuhan. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, the, doob, the doobie district of Wuhan. Yeah. I saw you in that you uh, you you kind of asked uh, the notoriously cranky David Crosby to rate your uh, rolling skills. I did, yeah. and I don't. He yeah. didn't side with you, right? No, he picked my friend Matt. Okay, uh, which is why you prefer old... Nash. Well, I prefer Nash anyway. Crosby's, I mean, he's, Crosby's amazing. David Crosby on Twitter is a fantastic follow. You're right. I don't, I don't think Nash is even on Twitter. So uh, Crosby wins that one easily. Our friend, our good buddy, Matt Dunlap, he's, uh, does all of our Sheepdogs art design and collabs on just about all the sort of content that we put out. And he's, uh, he and I are always laughing. Like we had, we used to hang out in San Francisco when he lived there and we'd, have like a joint rolling contest on the street and all this kind of dumb shit. So we've always been joking about getting Crosby to raid our joints, but uh, mine wasn't very good. So I don't, uh, <laughs> I'm not surprised that that Dunlap won, but yeah, it was funny. Now, was it just that one that wasn't good or were you, did you kind of buckle under the pressure a little bit of having Crosby judge you? No, I was, well, <laughs> I, I rolled it in advance, but I think I was a little, I had a few whiskeys before I, I rolled it. <laughs> oh, okay. I've never been the like my. I never said I was the best roller. I'm the fastest roller. I can roll a joint faster than anybody. That's my claim to fame. But that, which is very that. important, or many times. It comes from hanging out like in bars and like rolling it like behind a couple pint glasses and then like sneaking out for a a doobie or whatever. Like I was always doing that kind of thing. So you're not applying for like that role or that position, that paid position with Snoop Dogg anytime soon, unless he needs really fast nah, Snoop would, joints. He'd be pissed at my Jays. No, <laughs> I've always wondered that when you get like the pre rolls that like come from like the, 
whatever dispensary places like is it actually a guy it's like because i mean they even have like the paper uh, filters and stuff like do they have like cause I mean, obviously like the old cigarette rolling machines that like your aunt had in the 80s or whatever but like do they actually have a guy who's rolling them or do they have like a machine that's rolling them? i don't know they gotta be machine they're those cone those like little they're like a bud was showing me he's got like a the, like little bitch stick like ones the little virginia slim looking masks yeah. they're like there's like uh they're like perfect they're like they gotta be machine mold little thin yeah. pinners yeah no I, it's either a machine or like many many men inside of the machine <laughs> yeah. i think is how right. how it might work and yeah. also in china migrant workers yeah yeah so you had a little time over the last year you recorded, but what what else kept you busy during the last year? Was it like, I hate to set it up in a nice late, but was it actually kind of, you guys have been so busy and go, go, go for the past, you know, almost decade. Was there any part of it that was just kind of nice to just chill and, and lay back a little bit? Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah, I mean, yes and no. I mean, like it's it's absolutely nice to get a little break and do a little more like home life kind of stuff, but Ryan and I both live in Toronto and it's like, you know, it's just been one shutdown after another here. So, um, hasn't been as much to do, <laughs> unfortunately, but you know, there's plenty of things we can keep busy with, like, you know, between writing songs, grilling, playing super Nintendo, uh, <laughs> watching sports. There's a few things to do. Now I think I'd heard that you'd gotten into the grilling and I can see Patrick's eyes turning already. Just go, go, ahead. That, that go was, ahead, Pete. Go this, ahead. This is going to turn in the next 10 minutes is going to be the meat portion of the podcast. Uh, go talk, yeah. Because yeah. I also, in the last year, uh, really developed a passion for, for grilling. So what uh, what's your go-to? What do you like to uh, what do you like to smoke? Uh, well, I'm, I, I've got pretty good at doing ribs because that's kind of like the entry level kind of stuff. Uh, I, I did a brisket a couple of weeks ago. It was my first time doing a brisket because that's like really intimidating. And it's like it took like ten hours, so it was cool. That was good. And did you get hit um, at the? But the first brisket I did, I didn't know anything about the stall, so it'll yeah. it, it'll it'll hit a certain temperature, and then it just won't budge from that for a while, and you just yes. gotta let it get through it. Yeah, I had the little like that thermometer that snakes through the the you know you have outside the grill. Yeah. So I was keeping an eye on it. I read like my my technique is I'll read like. A thousand different recipes and then i just kind of like shake them up in my head and i just like make up my own recipe so uh i did know about the stall uh yeah man it's like a it's like such a like you can only have so many hobbies right like because like it's like golf or something where you have to like do it all the time and like develop your techniques and like it's like if you screw up a brisket it's like there's an entire two days and like a hundred dollar piece of meat potentially <laughs> And it's like you can't just like go start again because it's like discouraging. Yeah, it's just like it's I feel like, like it. brisket is the one that like if you go to a place, it's a really good judge of the character of whatever barbecue place you are right. going to. Because totally. br brisket is like the like I've had like subpar ribs, but they're still good ribs. Like I feel like I've had more bad brisket a lot of the time than I've had good brisket. I mean, that's the fun thing about touring is you get to go to all these crazy barbecue places. And so then you're like, your, your bar is set very high. But I feel like that definitely is that one that's really hard to like get right more than it is to like, you know, get wrong. Took me three. I think it was a, probably, three my, briskets. Three, probably my third brisket where I was like, okay, I think I got this. Gambling with time and meat. <laughs> but you're right. And it's, uh, yeah, it's, they're not the cheapest piece of meat out there. I'm I'll throw, a, I'll throw a curveball at you. One thing that I did, so uh, I got a really great barbecue over, uh, you know, quarantine as well. Uh, play, I think called the, I don't know if you guys ever heard the PK grill. You had actually was the one that told me about it. And uh, so I got really also into grilling and got this new barbecue, but my, uh, my girlfriend is, is vegetarian. So I got really into recreating uh, like meat barbecue things, vegetarian. So I actually did a veg, I made my own vegetarian brisket to try what would be my best attempt at like recreating uh you know a smoked brisket so wait what what wilding. what was it yeah i made like it's i made a seitan yeah, yeah. Uh, using like wheat gluten and sort of like seasoned it as much as i could to sort of replicate what i would <laughs> sort of imagine i've done a few of them now so i've kind of like changed the recipe a little bit and then i smoked it on the barbecue for like four hours 
you know, and, and sort of try to give it that like bark on the outside and still have sort of the meat texture on the inside. But it's been fun because like she's well, has never eaten a brisket. So it's great because she has no idea what it actually tastes like. So for whatever, as long as it tastes good, I'm good. But it was a pretty fun experiment to try to do that as well. Are you guys like when you when you're on tour and you've been touring for years throughout, you know, all sorts of parts of the world but what is what are your eating habits are you guys constantly eating together is it something that you plan in advance or something you just base on how however much time you've got in a day uh, a show day we almost never eat together unless it's like a lunch maybe okay everyone's got their own like you don't want to eat heavy before a show mm -hmm. probably the most likely eating together on a show day would be like a piece of pizza or whatever the like late night thing is but like an off day then we're like good chance we'll like have a like sit down meal like you know find some place that looks good usually a good like local restaurant that's got you know whether if it's a city that has it's known for some kind of cuisine you know in europe or in the states or wherever or if it's just like some random like place with not much going on oftentimes it'll just be like you know the keg or something like that or like <laughs> the hotel bar don but cherries like, don cherries steakhouse get the sponsorship yeah. going boys yeah yeah uh, i eat i eat pretty much every day for you know in a winter tour i'll eat uh, like faux vietnamese soup for lunch if i can because it's like my you it's the ultimate like uh when, especially when it's cold and you're touring in canada yeah. it's like you can always find a vietnamese restaurant pretty much in every city and it's, I don't know. Do you guys have a Vietnamese restaurant? Oh, yeah. In, uh, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Saskatchewan or Saskatoon has like 15 Vietnamese restaurants. I've been to a seen. really, really good Vietnamese. My girlfriend's family, you know, spent a lot of time in Saskatoon. And a few years ago, we drove out there for a party and they took me to this Vietnamese restaurant they've been going to for like 20 years. And it was. Which it, one was it? I wish I could remember the name. It was uh, not in a place where I would expect any sort of good restaurant to be. That's, that's the key. Yeah. 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 That's. That's the yeah. I don't know why Saskatoon has so many Vietnamese restaurants, but it's it's like our our secret weapon. And it, and most of them are really good too. Most of them like are a lot yeah, better yeah. than a lot of places. But we definitely are big fans of like the big communal team meal. Like we definitely try to do that a lot. Like take everybody out, you know, band and crew, and and go somewhere and, and try a new meal. I mean, one of our favorite things is we love going to, uh, you know beer halls in germany is one of our favorite things to do like getting like the pork knuckle and the you know schnitzel and oh, drinking yeah. big things of beer i mean we love that i mean we love barbecues obviously a big one like we really love going Texas. and doing the, doing the big band and crew communal meal we try to like map those out so like if we're you know on often we'll do like three or four on one off kind of thing when it comes to touring and we try to make sure that that one off is like we go somewhere and wherever we're staying on that day off is like, yeah, it sometimes it ends up being like a local steakhouse. We try to like do to plan at least one like kind of band and crew meal for everybody. Oh, um, didn't we get a steak in Red Deer when we did that? No, I remember we definitely hit a steakhouse when we were there. One, I remember a Red Deer for that. Uh, what do you guys have there? There's something there. I don't know. The, you, well, we do have a did the. I, if you would have played on, or whatever, yeah, you played that, the right? the Centrium, so it would have been on the south end of the city. Interesting. I'm like, not there's sure. A, there's a, like the Montanas is there. Montanas. Oh, Montanas. 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 <laughs> that was Montanas. It definitely wasn't in Montana, but it was. I, I want to say it was like. Was there a restaurant that's like really high up or something like that? And like, a, no, that that was in Lethbridge. Oh yeah, uh, Leth uh, Lethbridge has that big. Wa it used to be a yeah. water tower. That's right. That's where they have it. Oh, okay, 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 cool. And it was good. We did, play the, we did play the exhibition, but we also will often do the like whoever like if it's a fly-in kind of show, like whoever the guy is that will come and pick us up and be driving us around. We'll get them to recommend, you know, where we should go. Like we love getting the like what's the best place to eat in town. Me and you and also love going to places and like, being like doing the like take us on a journey. Like we love the going to a place where someone says it's the best place in town and just being like telling the waiter and the chef or whatever like. We want to have like your give us all your best things. We want to try. Like yeah. that's that's one thing we got really into uh, with traveling is just being able to go and, and be able to do that. It's been a real privilege for sure. I wish uh, servers and restaurants would do that more proactively because I remember going to a restaurant downtown Toronto with my girlfriend a couple years ago, and we we're really excited to go to this place. You know, we've been hearing lots about it, and we told the waiter or the server what we wanted. And he straight up, he's like, listen, like, you can have that, but I'm not going to be happy. 
Like I, <laughs> I, I really strongly think you should get this instead. And I don't think he was wrong. I think he was absolutely right to say that. It was a bold move, but it paid off. I respect That's, him I like for it. it. Where was it? Can we easily run away? It was at uh, Momofuku. Oh, oh nice. yeah. Yeah, it Which was floor. Uh, first, yeah. <laughs> first floor, Noodle Bar. Noodle, nice. noodle Bar. It was like, and yeah. it was, it wasn't even, it was uh, like a monthly feature. It was like a chicken tan tan ramen, so like a ramen with ground chicken in the bottom. But nice. it was, it was the monthly feature, and we were there. You know, it was our first time there, so we figure we're gonna go and get the signature dish, which is probably like a pork ramen of sorts. And he's like, No, no, no. I like you need. I, I need you to do this for me and yourself. That's I'm nice. into it. Yeah, I like when they do that. I want them to be opinionated. Like, I I often will ask the server what to get, and I, it, it like offends me when they're like, "Uh, well, people really like the chicken fingers. Like, they obviously <laughs> are not, you know, invested. I mean, I guess I should look around and see if there's like, you know, you know, laminated menu with pictures on it before I ask that question. But no, they need. I I appreciate. I respect the proactive. Uh... You know the the recommendations. I think it's important, very much so. Oh yeah. So at any time during this last year, has mm. there just been like an urge to get in a vehicle and drive just because you're so used to it? Like, I mean, you guys have been on the road pretty much nonstop for so long. Is that Ryan urge? Ryan to... drove. Ryan drove to Saskatchewan. I, I did my first like. I mean, we have done that drive from Toronto to Saskatchewan, Saskatchewan to Toronto, like more than many <laughs> you know yep. I mean, it would always be like overnight like we would used to always do it where we would leave Saskatoon in the morning and drive straight to Toronto wow. get to Toronto and we tour around you know eastern around Toronto area um you know so yeah me and my girlfriend decided that we didn't really want to fly with COVID and stuff so we decided to drive back to Saskatoon my brother had a baby and it was my grandma's birthday so I just did it but it was it was crazy because I've never done that drive as an adult except for like you know, whatever, white knuckling it overnight, <laughs> uh, driving back and forth from Sassu to Toronto. So yeah, it was really a different experience, like stop along the way and not sleep, you know, in the upstairs of the Apollo and Thunder Bay and things like that. Like it was like a pretty, uh, it was a pretty cool experience to go on tour without a tour. It's actually pretty fun. <laughs> Traveling's fun, you know, it's good. And it's fun to do it, you know, when you're not having to always play shows too. Well, and like you say, you get a chance to stop and, and, and look and, and see. Yeah, I appreciate, totally. appreciate the scenery a little bit more than you might on other trips, for sure. Well, we're super fortunate because, I mean, like, we always, like, we've been to every province and territory. The only place, I guess, we haven't every province and territory. We played in the Yukon and Northwest Territories. I guess we haven't been to Labrador, but, uh, you know, but a lot of these places, no di yeah, no, di <laughs> no different than, like, when we go overseas or whatever, a lot of these places, we only get to sort of experience what's in our immediate surrounding right I mean, uh, paris is a really good example we played paris many times and only recently did we actually get to travel in and do things in paris it was usually like you drive in you play the show and you leave because it's so fucking expensive to stay in paris like so you just you stay somewhere outside of paris and and whatever and so i've been there five or six times or four or five times probably without having to see anything except the hotel and, and the venue and so in the same way like I mean, it's super fortunate we've traveled across this country so many times. But yeah, like you don't really stop at that like chip truck that's you know outside of like Batchawana Bay or something like that, right? It's like you're not you're not pulling over and checking out the secondhand store as much as you want to. That's like you know it says three kilometers up the road. It's cool to do that trip. I mean, we also are very fortunate though because we have seen this country many times over, and a lot of people can't say that thing. we live in a really big country that's what's it's been kind of cool about COVID because people rather than going to mexico are like maybe i'll go to i don't know like northern bc or something like that and check it out and i think it's like helping us to experience our our hometown or our home country a little bit more that's a really good point because uh I, yeah i've had the privilege to drive across most of the country and like it's in, it's insane Canada is insane. Our country is, we, we've got a little bit of everything to it's offer. Funny, the first time I'm born and raised Albertan, and uh, I did that drive out to uh, to London last year. And, I mean, I thought I knew what a lake was, <laughs> but I had no friggin' clue what a lake was. <laughs> when you drive along one. <laughs> drive along one for a full day. Yeah. <laughs> so would you guys, like, if you're, let's say you're touring Paris, and maybe Paris is a bad example because you said it was expensive, but, like, if, if you've got um, a, a, a tour of Europe and then you've got a couple weeks off before you're needed back here for something, would you book a vacation if you're going to some of these places and just stick around after the tour was done? Yeah, we. Yeah. I mean, we've all, we've all kind of done it. I mean, I, I stayed on in 
in Holland one time. We finished our tour in Amsterdam and I just uh, left. Amsterdam's cool, but it's kind of like the Vegas of Europe. So uh, uh, J- Jimmy and I took our ladies to Utrecht, uh, which is like very Paris, sorry, very Amsterdam-esque, but without the tourism. So much more chill and it's like a 20 minute train right away. And, and then we just went up in the country and chilled out and it's like a beautiful country, you know, just like little lambs, le- like literally lambs leaping and <laughs> geese, and geese that look like they walked off the page. <laughs> yeah. you know, it's, Julie it's Andrews so is really singing out. on a hill. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's like, you, I don't know. People want to think that like rock and rollers just want to like, you know, bang age till 6 a.m. or something. But it's like, uh, uh, man when you're down on tour you kind of just want to relax and chill like it's yeah. it's you're it's you're really bang, nice. banging <laughs> dutch cheese till, till <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> oh man i went i went to the towns of gouda and edom on that trip <laughs> yeah. where it all started and it's funny too because like after a tour it you know you want to decompress and sometimes that needs to be just going home and just laying home but yeah but one of the best trips i ever did was in europe as well where we finished a a tour in Madrid and I uh, I rented a motorcycle and I did like a week long seven day solo motorcycle trip through Spain. Oh wow. And I did uh I only went to places that like I basically only went to small towns. I didn't stay in any of the big cities. I did because we've been to a lot of the big cities. So I only did basically started in Madrid and went down to Valencia and rode along the coast all the way up to the Pyrenees Mountains, went through the Pyrenees Mountains, over top along through France and back down to Basque country and then finish back in Madrid. So I did like this whole loop solo. And it was one of the best things I ever did because like, you know, when you're touring, you're in a vehicle with guys, you're in a, you know, you're just basically around people all the time. So go to a, on a trip where literally I didn't hardly met a single person that spoke English the entire time. And I just sort of like navigate my way. And it was, it was like a really scary time at certain points. Cause like I, you know, had kind of weird, some weird things happen, but it's also like really fun and a great way to like decompress afterwards you know, in a very like simplistic sort of like way where you just travel solo and experience. It was like, it wasn't about like where I was staying or the city was about just like riding a motorcycle for eight, 10 hours a day. The Neil Peart experience. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I mean, that's, that's, that that was definitely an inspiration for that. I mean, that, that guy had a crazy, crazy life and I can't, (laughs) well, I will never understand what that was all about, but you know, that's, that's the idea, right? It's like the idea that just being by yourself and and kind of being with your thoughts which is a cool thing and then also experiencing rural spain and discovering castles and and uh you know kind of wild things like that damn so when you're on the road and you're crisscrossing back and forth across canada as you've done many many times uh, is there anything you guys do to make it different each time like i mean it can kind of become old it's a beautiful country you're right but as you're back and forth and back and forth what do you guys do to kind of keep things fresh or, or make it a little different every time Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, it's like we definitely try to explore each place we go to. Um, sometimes it's just about the routine and making sure the show happens and you're, and you're kicking ass that night on stage. But, uh, man, you got to kind of like it's you kind of at the whim of where you are, like especially if you're touring by bus, which we do in Canada. It's like you're like parked outside the venue. You might walk to a hotel and take a shower otherwise you're kind of at the mercy of what's around you i guess if you're in a bigger place you can take an uber somewhere check something out i mean people will give you recommendations of like you got to check this out and a lot of time it's food but like we're just not eating a big dinner on show day because it just doesn't make sense because like i can't i can't relax and eat a big meal before a show um and then it's like someone will be like come to my keg party it's like well the bus leaves at 3 a.m like okay but i, I can't stay alone <laughs> so you know if that i think it's like the fine line between uh making sure that every day you're ready to, to throw down when you go on stage but at the same time like being open to the experiences of the road because like there is a beautiful magic to kind of like that sort of like gypsy vibe of just like blowing into town, playing a show and getting the hell out that night. Like, it's really cool. I think one of the one things that is cool about being from Saskatchewan, and I, I think Alberta can kind of relate to this too, is that, you know, there's a lot of people that we went to high school with or that we've known for many years that sort of just like scatter afterwards, right? Like you basically like, I mean, we, we played a show in, in we opened for John Fogarty in, you know, 
Sydney, Australia, and someone yelled out, go Riders, while we were on <laughs> the stage. Like, you literally go anywhere and you'll find people from Saskatchewan. And I think it, it's a Western, I think a lot of Western Canadian people kind of like, well, often spread out and stuff. And so what's cool is that because we get to do that, we often get to see, pretty much every, we have friends in almost every single city, whether it's friends from back home or friends we met along the way. And so I don't know if it's necessarily, it's like almost adverse of that is that I think what's cool about it is that we kind of feel a little bit at home now in all these different places. So it, it doesn't feel like you're in a strange place. Sure. If we go to, you know, Czech Republic, we're not going to really know anybody and it's going to be like a weird foreign place, but it's almost that weird familiarity where every town sort of feels like, these are the people we hang about. This might be the person that might, you know, text you because they see that you're in town and get to hang out with. So there's like a certain familiarity that comes with that. And that's like almost comforting. It's like, I miss that. There's a bunch of people I haven't seen in now a couple of years because we haven't been able to tour uh, that has become used to the fact. So it's almost like the keeping it fresh is, is you know, maybe finding that new spot to go to, the new bar to go to or whatever, but also the keeping it familiar is the fact that you have a bit of like a family or, you know, friends that are in each city, no different than in your home city. It kind of becomes like Canada, but kind of comes your home city in a lot of ways. And that's always really fun. That's like half the fun of going on tour, except for the fact that all of those people forget that you have to do that every single night. So like, <laughs> so no, I can't. Party time. Um, yeah, like that night where you're like, man, I, I can barely talk because I was partying last night too long and I, I'm going to go to bed early tonight. You have to like explain, let them down easy. <laughs> do you guys feel that when you do get back on tour after, you know, the last couple of years, it's just going to be, you know, you'll settle right into it immediately. That old, old good feeling is going to return. You're, you're not going to have to warm up to it at all. You're going to have to remind each other who gets what bunk on the bus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, it'll be all right. Yeah. I think we'll be fine. It'll be like, you know, ride, riding a bike or whatever, I guess, but it's, man, it's not like it's, uh, I, we, we did like some social distance shows last year and it, okay, was like, cool. it always takes a little bit to, you know, shake the cobwebs off, but it'll be, it'll be back quick. I think it, the other thing is that I think, you know, like you said, like we, we haven't really taken much of a break in, I mean, a decade or more, right? Like, you know, for the last, we've been a band for 17 years and for like we've been touring for 15 of those you know 17 years so you know it, COVID was a weird thing because it made it forced us to slow down because you always feel that pressure to keep going keep going keep going like you got to go to the next thing you got to move on and it's weird because it, it, it made it forced us to pause but in that reflection I think we've missed that like so much so I think well not only will we settle back in but I think there's going to be again we'll just be so excited to be I mean there'll be times there always are times when you're on the road where you feel tired and you feel you know, whatever you miss home and you miss those comforts and you know, whatever, but there's also that thing. It's like, you crave that interaction. You crave that, like you play music and you get feedback back from, from people in that crowd. And I think that's really exciting to have that back. So I think there probably will be like a new renewed energy when we get back to it, because we're so excited to finally be able to do it. And like you even said, we did social distance shows, but playing to a parking lot full of cars is so different than playing to a room full of like people who are just wanting to party and, yeah. and let loose. Well, I definitely know here and many other places there will be a, a probably a renewed appreciation as a fan or as someone in the crowd to see a live band on stage again. I know I'm going to feel that way. Can't wait. <laughs> yeah. What, what's the like? What's the vibe? In, like, are they talking about doing stuff for summer? Or anything like that Not there, summer. Or? No. Um, no. Like, I don't think so. From what I understand from uh, from Bo's owner, there's like emails are going back and forth like crazy. Agents and promoters are looking at dates, but as of right now, I think most things are towards the end of the year, or maybe even early next year, uh, for booking booking things in here. Yeah, I mean, we're we're like announcing things soon cool. outside of Canada, but not until 2022, and I think. It's weird because like you don't want to rush it. You don't want to be the band that everyone's like, oh, that's the band that gave everyone COVID. Like, you don't want to be that band. Well, that not band. only that, but like I remember a year ago, you had bands rescheduling their shows for fall of 2020. Right. And that didn't yeah. happen. Like <laughs> it wasn't even close to happening. So, uh, you know, we've talked to a lot of bands and musicians that have been very patient and, um, you know, uh, very cautiously realistic about about schedules and timelines so i think we understand the hesitation to make uh, too many announcements too soon but that's good to know that you guys have some some fun plans in the works we're very much looking forward to hearing what those might be <laughs> and i imagine you're excited to play these songs live like yeah 
yeah. to be sitting yeah, on those. You gotta and... figure out how to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I do want to ask though: is uh, is there is there a real Jesse? Please. Yeah, she's down. She's downstairs right now. Okay. Ah. Very yeah. cool. Well, I love that song. I love the uh, the places it took me over the weekend Thanks, when I was man. listening to it. So. Yeah, it's again, the, it's the take us on a journey. You and was the waiter, and that was your take us on a journey. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I road tested the EP this past weekend around the fire pit in the backyard, and it just played oh, yeah. perfectly. So congrats. Um, so amazing. yeah, this this uh, episode will air a couple of days before it released, so May twenty eighth. Oh shit! Right, I forgot. This is next week. This will be next. Right, right, uh, right, right. Next Wednesday, this will come out. So we'll still be a couple of days before release uh, once this. Uh, it's good. Once this comes out, it's damn good. To our listeners, it's damn good. And <laughs> one of these years, we'll get to see it. Yeah, hopefully real soon, man. Hopefully soon. Yeah, for sure. Um, Perfect. Well, you know what, guys? Thank you. We kept you for so long, and we could probably keep chatting for uh, a while yet. Great. So we'll continue this the next time you guys get through Part Red Deer. Part two. All yeah. right. Thanks so much, guys. Congrats Appreciate on the record, guys. It's awesome. Hey, thank you. We'll see you Thanks, again boys. Thanks, Peace guys. Out. Take right. it easy, cool. then. Wow, like I really could legit talk to them for hours. You've and you didn't even get to talk to about baseball. You wanted to talk about I baseball. I really didn't you? wanted to bring up baseball because the Sheepdogs do have a pretty good baseball connection. I know that you and uh, for sure, and I'm sure the other guys are as well, big baseball fans. Right. Uh, plus, you and spent a lot of time in San Francisco, which uh, I enjoy the city and the baseball team. Right. So yeah, always leave them wanting more. Um, and you've talked to you and before. Yes. Uh, a couple, a couple of times, phone conversations. Okay, before. okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. No, that was great. That was fantastic, and uh, I hope everyone goes and checks out their new EP, No Simple Thing. Um, I mean, the Sheepdogs, I think, have the potential, if not already, to become one of Canada's m- more um, recognizable, well, important bands in Canadian music history. Go through the albums mm-hmm, for sure, and just look at all the singles that you know, and they've built a massive repertoire. Mm-hmm. Of uh, pretty instantly recognizable uh, jams. And apparently another band that when they come through Red Deer, you're going to have to cook for. You realize that's what you're doing, right? (laughs) Every time you bring up your smoker, your grill, you're setting up so that you have to, you're going to, when they come to a show at Bo's, you're going to have to walk in with a full brisket wrapped in foil, ready for them to consume. You're looking at me like this is a bad thing. (laughs) I'll do it. You, you. All right. I'll, I'll cook for anybody but you. Oh, that's true. That is actually, I can confirm <laughs> hey, that is wait, the no, case. No, no, no. You got some cornbread. Yeah, I you did got have some a slice cornbread. Of cornbread. <laughs> that cornbread was pretty good. So, Pete, what are you going to do now? I'm going to uh, smash the subscribe button on YouTube, the Bose Bar and Stage YouTube. Mm-hmm. I'm going to like and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Twitter. And I'm going to come up with some dance moves for our TikTok. Cool, man. That's sweet. That sounds like a fun solo project. Um, thank you so much for joining us for another episode of The Road to the Stage. Again, follow, like, uh, subscribe to that YouTube channel. Check out our last few episodes. They've been a lot of fun. And that includes this new one with the Sheepdogs. And um, I think that's it. We'll see you next Wednesday. 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 The Road the Stage is produced by Ryan Cooley and Riley Suryin. Recorded in Red Deer, Alberta, and in partnership with Bose Bar and Stage, Troubled Monk, and Tourism Red Deer. The Road the Stage.